I want to talk to you today about criminal trial procedure, and this is for judge alone trials. So it's a judge alone trial in the Ontario Court of Justice or the higher court, which is the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. So how does a trial proceed? What are the, what are the steps? And I'll, I'll just go over the basics very, very simply so you understand the steps that are involved. Well, first of all, many trials, not all, have what are called pre-trial applications. And this is, this is really part of the trial, but it's called pre-trial applications. It's, it's part of the trial process, I might add. So those are such things where you're trying to, the defense counsel, for example, is trying to exclude evidence, like they're trying to throw at a breast sample or throw at a confession. And there's often written argument done. Sometimes evidence is called in these, and sometimes not. And this can sometimes be argued even before the trial date. So you might have a pretrial application set 30, before, 30 days before the actual trial date, or as part of the trial proper, e even before the trial starts, or, or sometimes even during the trial. For example, charter applications, uh, which are trying to throw out evidence, they're part of the trial proper and can be argued as part of the trial or at the beginning of the trial. It really depends. So, so once the actual trial starts where you're calling evidence, how does that work? So the Crown has the burden of proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt. So the Crown will call all of their witnesses. So let's take their first key witness as a, a complainant, for example, in a sexual assault trial. They will call that witness. They'll typically go through their evidence in chronological order from start to finish, and that's called examination in chief. Those questions can be who, what, when, where, why type questions. In other words, you cannot put words in the witness's mouth. You cannot lead them. You have to ask them what happened, where were you, who were you with, what were you wearing, those type of questions, as opposed to leading questions. The defense counsel can then do cross-examination of that witnesses. And the goal there, of course, is to challenge their credibility and reliability of witness. That is done through leading questions which, uh, which suggest the answer. For example, the ball was red, correct? Or the ball was red. You're getting into a rhythm where you're not having to say correct. You're just making declarative statements. That's my technique, which the witness, you're directing the witness in certain areas, okay? And that's called cross-examination. It's, it's an art form. It's a very powerful tool. If you see a good criminal lawyer do, do it, you'll see the steps that are involved, the cleverness of setting up the witness to attack their credibility and reliability in any criminal case. At the end of your cross-examination, the defense counsel, the Crown, if things need to be clarified or issues arose which the Crown could not have anticipated during examination chief, they're allowed to re-examine the witness but again, they have to use open-ended questions, who, what, when, where, why. So that pattern continues until the Crown presents all of their evidence, including documentary evidence, photographs, you name it, usually done through witnesses, of course. That's called viva voce evidence, by the way, a Latin term for evidence in person, testify in person. Now, at the end of the Crown's case, let's say they call five witnesses and it takes two or three days in a little slightly longer case. Some cases, cases takes weeks, some cases take, take one day. The defense counsel then has to ask himself or herself, there's a test. Should I apply for a directed verdict? That's a motion for non-suit. It means there's no evidence here. There's no case that the judge even needs to consider. So the test is that you would ask himself, is there some evidence upon which a jury or judge properly instructed could convict? It's a very low level test. Some evidence could convict. You know, most cases, there's not a, uh, it's not gonna be a successful directed verdict. I only make a directed verdict if I'm sure that I'm gonna win that, or even a gray area. Sometimes when it's in the gray area, or even leaning towards not the gray area, because the judge will sometimes give me a hint. Well, I don't agree that it's a directed verdict, Mr. Cruz, um, but do you really want to call your client to testify? In other words, they're giving you a hint that you've already won. You know there's reasonable doubt, so it's a useful tool. But you don't want to bring a directed verdict when there's absolutely no chance of it. It becomes ridiculous to, you know, at that point. So let's assume there's no directed verdict. Um, there is a case that the judge could convict on. Now you have to make a decision as defense counsel. Do I call the client to testify? Very difficult decision. Is there enough reasonable doubt without calling the client to testify? They have a right to remain silent. So let's assume you call the client. You call the client. 
same pattern, examination in chief by you, who, what, when, where, why by the defense counsel, cross-examination with leading questions by the Crown, re-examination if necessary by defense counsel, and that goes for all of the other witnesses you may call. At the end of all that process, in other words, the pattern repeats itself, examination in chief, cross-examination, re-examination. At the end of all that process, um, the Crown could call potentially reply evidence, but that's very limited to the defense evidence, very limited. It's not often called, but occasionally it is. Then now, that, that completes the trial evidence. One, if, there's, if there's reply evidence or no reply evidence, the, the trial completes in terms of the evidence at least. The trial still continues, but the, the evidence completes. Now it's up to final submission. So the defense lawyer goes first if they've called evidence, and they, they uh, uh, submit about the facts of the case, make final submissions about the facts, and apply the law. They may present case briefs, etc., arguing that there's a reasonable doubt and the judge should acquit on some or all of the charges. And similarly, the Crown, after that, then makes their closing arguments based on the facts and the law. And that can be a very involved and detailed process as well. Sometimes closing arguments can take hours, sometimes not, depending on, depending on the complexity of the case. And then the judge has to make a decision, which is called the, the judgment, essentially, is called. And in most cases, the judge will not make, even on a one-day trial that finishes, say, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, most judges want to take their time to make that decision and get all the facts and law straight, so they'll usually put it over for another day to do that. It's very rare that they make that decision on the same day. So there you have it. That's the criminal trial procedure in a quick nutshell. There's a lot of more complexity to that to it, but those are the steps in a, in a basic criminal trial. Thank you for watching our video. We are absolutely committed to bringing you the best possible criminal and DUI educational videos. If you found this video helpful, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you've been charged with a criminal offense in Ontario and require our services, please click on the link in the description below.